Hey, good morning, everyone. From the National Weather Service, do y'all hear me okay? Yes. Do y'all see me okay? So bear with us over here. We're, this is my first time doing a Zoom conference over here. We're dealing with a couple of uh, technical difficulties, but I think we have a, the camera and the microphone all lined up. Um, before we get started with our um, discussion on tropical cyclones and natural hazards, I do want to toss this over to the Honorable Governor Lou Leon Guerrero to open us up, and then also by Chuck Estevez, the Civil Defense Administrator. So, Governor, if you'd like to say a few words. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Governor. Uh, sorry, sorry, I just came on board late. Uh, I um, I was just at another Zoom meeting and uh, just wanted to say to you, all of you, thank you for uh, taking this uh, time to prepare us and to also continue on with the training that we need. As you know, typhoons are one of the uh, most uh, most uh, frequent, although we've had, we haven't had a really big strong one, but we've had storms and we must continue still to be informed and continue to be uh, aware of, of our plans to make sure that we are prepared. So I just wanted to welcome everybody for this annual uh, Tropical Cyclone and Disaster Preparedness uh, Seminar. Uh, and I appreciate the time that you are taking to um, again, be part of this. Um, as we discuss how to prepare for typhoon season uh, in an environment and a landscape of a public health emergency, uh, I wanted to just share a story and I'm reminded of one particular story. Um, and it's about, about a family of Amber, a a uh, starving grasshopper approached asked for a bite to eat. The ants were surprised by his request and asked if he had gathered food in the summer to store away for the upcoming winter. Uh, ashamed, the grasshopper said no, he didn't have time. He was so busy making music and having fun that before he knew it, summer was gone and he had not prepared anything for winter. Though the ants shared their food with him because what good, that's what good neighbors do, this fable highlights the importance of preparation. I truly believe that no one knows how to prepare quite like we do here in Guam. Whenever typhoon season rolls around, we make sure we have our supplies ready. We stock up on food, flashlights, and extra batteries. Our typhoon shutters are out and up on our windows and we go over our emergency plans. We are so prepared that our houses are built with concrete. While we have been blessed to have been spared from the wrath of a super typhoon for several years now, most of us know all too well the kind of destruction that follows such disasters. I'm sure we remember when we were hit with two of the biggest typhoons in recent history, only a few months apart. Much of our island was without power and water for months. It was a difficult time, but we got through it with the help of our families and friends and because we were ready and we were prepared. 
This typhoon season, we are presented with unprecedented challenges because of COVID-19. Our usual emergency plans must now meet higher standards of health and safety to ensure this virus is not transmitted when our people are most vulnerable. During this web webinar and virtual uh, seminar, I encourage everyone to discuss potential problems and issues that can arise because COVID-19 uh, is still around and how we can safely be uh, prepared with everything in place. While it may be tempting to spend our time in leisure or so focused on what we cannot do now, let us not be like the grasshopper who was ill prepared for the winter. Instead, we must be like the ants who knew to prepare the umbrella before it rained. And I just wanted to say again, thank you for all that you uh, have done to organize and to provide this uh, virtual seminar for our people so we can be prepared for emergencies. Thank you and for the opportunity to make remarks. Thank you, Governor, for speaking uh, with this seminar today. I'm gonna toss this over to the Honorable Lieutenant Governor Josh Snorri of Guam to say a few words. Thank you very much. And uh, let me first uh, thank the National Weather Service, who has been a longstanding partner of the government of Guam and the people of Guam uh, in helping us respond to, uh, as the governor said, what used to be a rather often occurrence. And it has been almost 18 years since we've had a major storm event that has caused widespread uh, devastation and damage to our island. So we've been quite lucky. Uh, but that luck, of course, is uh, will run out at some point. And the purpose of today's um, training is to really uh, tool everybody with the knowledge that is necessary for them to prepare uh, on, and how to respond uh, to the community. Uh, and I just wanna maybe just emphasize on uh, partnerships because really the most effective response to a natural disaster has to do with very strong collaborative efforts. And the more planning opportunities such as this, uh, this um, seminar today, gives each of those that are tasked with the responsibility for responding by, uh, for their agency to the government of Guam. It's a very, very important job. And so I do want to recognize that the partnership with the National Weather Service, with FEMA, with our military partners um, is very important, along with the collaborative efforts amongst and within the government of Guam. Um, Public Works, the Department of Education, GPA, Water Works, EPA, those are all agencies, along with others, the port, the airport, that have to respond uh, in very short order to things that may occur in a tropical cyclone. Um, we are charged with the protection of life and property, and we are compelled to be as responsive as we can. And so I do wanna congratulate everybody and thank them for being part of this. Uh, it's very important work um, and uh, I look forward to working with you in continuing to plan uh, as opposed to responding to an event. But I'm confident, as the governor said, that we'll be able to respond in a very, very effective way and protect people's lives. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, and like you said, it's a, a very tight partnership that we have with the National Weather Service with our FEMA and our Homeland Security partners, not just here on Guam, but also in the CNMI. Uh, we are excited to have the folks from Saipan here with us this morning. This is our first ever virtual seminar, but also a, a joint seminar with Guam and the CNMI. So hello and good morning to the to you all in CNMI. Um, finally, I'm gonna turn this over to the Homeland Security Administrator, Chuck Estevez, for a few words. Hey, Charles Estevez, if you are ready, we are waiting on your opening words. Hey, sorry about that. I had a uh, slight delay um, in the uh, the connection, but uh, 
Uh, first of all, I just uh, do want to thank the governor and the lieutenant governor uh, for their uh, words as well. Um, you know, of course, we also want to thank our partners of the National Weather Service and all our other partners uh, from both the military and Fed side, and our brothers and sisters over in the CNMI as well. Um, you know, uh, it, when people uh, talk about Guam's most prevalent threat, it's always the uh, it's always the threat of a uh, catastrophic storm that that we want to prepare for. And uh, what makes the issue even harder is that we're now having to prepare for these types of events in a COVID environment. The days of getting every single, everyone in the EOC and having the National Weather Service brief in mass is over. And so we have to learn how to leverage these new technologies um, in order to provide the latest updates to people. Uh, you know, uh, people, uh, there, uh, recently there have been a couple of critics of, um, uh, of the information uh, given um, the timeliness of information but um, you know we understand the challenges with predicting the weather. It's not it's not as easy as as you know uh, what you may say one hour may change the very next hour, and we've seen this in previous storms as well. Um, so uh, you know I can tell you that um, uh, uh, that the information you provide us it allows us to uh, expeditiously prepare. Uh, it allows us to uh, um, uh, plan and. And um, you know, we understand that uh, in the field of emergency management, we always have to be flexible. Uh, so you know, thank you everyone for participating in this event. And uh, we do encourage uh, everyone, as the governor said, to, to prepare now um, rather than later. And to please uh, develop that preparedness mindset in everything you do. Much. And uh, we'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Thanks, NWS. Thoughts, uh... I tried to compress that into a two hour seminar. So you're going to quite notice some of changes to how we're going to be presenting and this is all part of our learning and our adapting which is a skill that we've all been accustomed to when it comes to disaster preparedness so right now as i that it had alluded to my name is genevieve miller i'm the meteorologist in charge of the national weather service office here at teton and we welcome you all someday after COVID ends to come out and visit our office anytime we are really responsible for guam cnmi and the rest of Micronesia when it comes to all types of weather and we issue watches warnings for the entire area. This type of virtual simulation we're doing is going to be helpful for us so we can know how we're going to also reach our customers out in the CNMI and in the rest of Micronesia. So thank you for being our guinea pig when it comes to this. And thank you all for you know really staying true to this National Preparedness Month and participating in a lot of these events. Because again, every year we're gonna get new people and we're always going to constantly train. And I think we've been doing a really good job with uh, maintaining our level of expertise and of preparedness in Guam. So as you see, this is our weather forecast office. It was built for an 8.5 earthquake, which some of you remember back in 93, and also 200 mile an hour winds, which are part of what we happened during the Typhoon Paka back in 19, <laughs> gotta go do this one. 97. I said on my kids' years. But because of that, you know, it was a blessing in disguise that we were given the funding to build our own office. And since then, we've had this uh, state of the art building with two emergency generators, a water tank, some kitchen facilities, shower facilities, et cetera. I mean, the whole idea was to be able to let us do our jobs, not worry about the building, and be able to stay there for as long as needed. So, this is um, again inviting you all sometime in the near future. Space bars. Okay, click. Now just a quick overview of our area of responsibility and I'd like to just overlay this on the whole continental US. So the different islands around here are islands and groups that we do forecast for 
and they're both marine forecasts, aviation forecasts, general forecasts, and tropical cyclone forecasts. And you can see, you know, the whole area that we're looking at is practically what many of the different, the other 121 offices in the U.S. are doing. But ours covers the whole entire area of the U.S. or just one office here in Guam. And because of that, I'm going to move into what causes the weather around the Marianas, and I am going to introduce our next speaker, Mr. William Brandon Eilich. He is uh, one of our lead forecasters, and he has been with the Weather Service Forecast Office in Guam for over 10 years. Likewise, Brad Landon, sorry, they, they, they confuse me a lot. Landon, I, it's also the same, they, uh, been with the Weather Service for over 10 years. And just this year, he became our warning coordination meteorologist in place of our chip guard who retired last December. So thank you for your attention, and I hope you get to learn a lot from this. Questions will be addressed uh, towards the end of the workshop. If you have some questions, I think there's a chat function here, and we'll try to get to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. So good morning, everybody. I am Brandon, as uh, Jenny said, and uh, very, very glad to be presenting this morning. And uh, as she said, we, we've got quite a lot of information that in, in the past has spanned a two-day conference. And so we're going to be trying to boil it down into two hours. And uh, so you'll see some changes to the presentation. Uh, but definitely, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them up, and then we'll try to get to those uh, toward the end of this uh, workshop. But uh, just to go a little bit of the background about some of the weather patterns that we see across the, uh, the tropics, uh, it's a very simple pattern that we see that recurs through all of the weather systems. Uh, when we see upward motion, uh, that is what creates the clouds and rainfall, uh, air. We see little to no rain and those sunny, clear days with uh, nothing but blue sky. Uh, we also look for low level convergence where the wind comes together uh, just above the oceans surface and then upper level divergence a uh, thousand feet and leads to our rain and thunderstorms. Now this applies at all scales, small and large, from small rain showers to thunderstorms, typhoons, monsoons, and even the El Nino Enso cycle. And uh, a little bit more, wind blows from high pressure to low pressure. So it, if you imagine Blowing, uh, filling open your lips, that air comes rushing out. That's the same way nature works. Air goes from high pressure to low pressure, and that's why uh, typhoons have the stronger wind because of that low pressure at the center. Also, what we see, especially over Guam, is the land tends to heat much faster than the surrounding ocean. And in, the, in the wet season, we have those clouds form right over the island, and uh, one part can see flooding rains and uh, thunderstorms, while just a few miles away, uh, parts of Guam are sunny and clear. And, and when I visit schools, I like to explain how this works in a conventional format in your everyday kitchen. When you have your stove top, you turn your stove top on, you stick your hand right over the hot burner, you can feel that hot air rising. And, and in much a similar way, the island surface heats up versus the ground or the ocean that stays relatively cooler. And that's how we get that differential heating and those clouds forming right over the island. Sometimes we see this across the CNMI when the winds are very weak, uh, and, but otherwise the winds are just strong enough the clouds push offshore. So a couple of different scales, uh, we see our typical rain shower. Uh, these last anywhere from five to 20 minutes, 30 minutes, then they rain themselves out, stabilize, and then you have no, no remnant cloud cover. Going a little bit bigger, we have the thunderstorms that could be anywhere from a one to two mile feature or they can span 10, 20, 30 miles, and the cloud tops reaching up to about 60,000 feet. Those are when you see a lot of lightning. Getting bigger, we have our typhoons. Typhoons can span on the order of a couple of hundred uh, miles to over, over a thousand miles uh, for the whole cloud feature. And we saw that with Typhoon Tiff many, many, many years ago. And then on the really massive scale are the monsoons. These can uh, span two to 8,000 miles, and those actually become more of a uh, global in nature. 
and, and you have the upward motion could be centered over India, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, other parts of Asia, the Philippines, and then the downward motion over the Middle East and parts of Africa. So think of the stovetop, that is one humongous massive stovetop sitting over Eastern Asia, and then the downward motion much farther, either over to the Central Pacific or over uh, the Middle East and Africa. This time of year, we start seeing the monsoon trough. Uh, for 2020, has been kind of an odd year. We've not seen the monsoon really reaching out into the West Pacific as much as normal. Uh, 2015, 1997, the monsoon was quite a, a recurring pattern. And when we see that monsoon trough, we start seeing the southwesterly winds uh, developing uh, across the uh, eastern Micronesia, uh, south of uh, Guam and the Marianas. Sometimes we see westerly winds extending all the way into central and eastern Micronesia. And where you see that curvature, that counterclockwise rotation, that is where we see a lot of our tropical systems developing and forming. Uh, in, in 2015, uh, 2015 was a very busy El Nino. We saw a lot of storms developing in central and eastern Micronesia, and then they came right toward the Marianas and threatened us quite a few times. Uh, same thing for 2018, where we saw typhoons Mancut and U2 uh, striking in the CNMI. And uh, so the, the big problem with the monsoon is those heavy showers, gusty winds, low ceilings. And for those in the aviation community, low ceilings refers to a thick cloud layer, very close to the ground. It makes uh, aircraft operations a little bit more difficult because it is quite restrictive on your operations. And again, tropical cyclones tend to form right along the axis where you see that maximum curvature of the cyclonic flow. Now this is another picture of one of the more notorious monsoon surges we saw back in 2002. It had a couple of typhoons, uh, tropical storms well north of the Marianas. But across the Marianas, we were in a solid southwesterly flow. That southwest flow is very moist. It brings heavy showers. And here on the radar image, that's some massive heavy showers coming across Guam. Uh, that's where we see some of our flooding that causes some uh, real inclement conditions. Uh, similarly, uh, in the trade wind season, in the first half of the year from January through June, that's our, our dry season. But the, the trade wind trough can also bring uh, a wet periods of showers across the Marianas and much of Micronesia. And this is where we get a lot of our rainfall in the dry season. So you get these convergent northeast trade winds uh, with the southeast trade winds, and they line up right across Micronesia. And sometimes uh, this, this line of clouds will stretch over the Marianas and give us our wet conditions. It keeps us from being completely bone dry. Um, but there is a, a little bit of a limit on how far north this uh, rises. Sometimes we'll see it come up toward Guam. But unfortunately for the CNMI, especially Tinian, and Saipan and the far northern islands, they tend to stay drier, and that's why we see much drier conditions uh, on average for Saipan and Tinian than we do for Guam. And, uh, and then on the bottom right, you see the satellite-based rainfall estimates, and you can see where the ITCZ lines up just north of the equator in the summer months. And then as the, the sun drops to the southern hemisphere in the winter months, uh, that line of convergence lines up south of the equator. And uh, so, yes, we see heavy showers, low cloud bases, and uh, it's a very narrow cloudiness zone. So that can be quite a bit of a, a rainfall gradient north to south, depending ex exactly where you are. Um, and uh, we see that strengthen in the La Nina events, uh, such as this time of year. Also in the, the dry months of uh, early, early year, January through May or so, uh, we start seeing shear lines. So we have cold fronts that come off of Japan, they, they move eastward across the Pacific Ocean, but the very southern extent develops into a shear line. Uh, on both sides, the winds are more easterly in nature, but you get this small convergence line that will sometimes drift right over the Marianas. And when it does, there's your low clouds, there's your widespread uh, rainfall. Uh, sometimes rainfall does not really amount to a whole lot, maybe a quarter of an inch, but it's gonna be notoriously wetter and much cloudier and cooler when these shear lines are overhead. We also see the tropical upper tropospheric trough, which is uh, common this time of year when in the summer and early fall months. 
Uh, these are upper level winds, about 25 to 35,000 feet. And uh, while they don't really directly lead to showers and thunderstorms, if there is any type of low level disturbance, such as a surface trough, uh, these upper level troughs can enhance those showers and thunderstorms, making them quite widespread in nature. And uh, sometimes when they are persistent, slow moving and long lived, they can actually generate tropical cyclones. And uh, for those in the aviation community, these can produce severe turbulence and wind shear uh, that pilots would tend to like to avoid. So here's one a satellite example. And uh, so you can see this is water vapor imagery and where you see the darker shades, that is drier sinking air. And then the whiter, the milkier, uh, that is the cloud cover upper level moisture. And so the winds around the tropical upper, upper tropospheric trough tend to go around in a clockwise motion. And when they round out, they tend to diverge. So I mentioned that upper level divergence earlier. That's where you get that upward motion and across Guam and the CNMI and the Northern Mariana Islands. That's where you have a lot of the reinforced upward motion, showers and thunderstorms. And now when we get to a bigger scale, uh, here we have the El Nino La Nina pattern. And, and you, it is a, a big feature in a lot of news locally and internationally because it has quite a big relationship to what happens globally, uh, especially across the US, all across the Pacific. Uh, we see uh, sea level rises and falls on the order of two feet, uh, depending on what part of the, the ocean you are. And, uh, but ultimately it's a redistrib uh, redistribution of the warm surface water that is coupled with the atmosphere. And, and so here you see uh, the warm water at the surface of the Pacific when you have those westerlies that are enhanced and increased across the equatorial Pacific, that warm water shifts eastward. And this is what we call a transition into El Nino. And uh, bringing back that kitchen example, that's where you see the burner. Where you see the burner, that's where you have the hot air rising. And then you have more clouds, thunderstorms, showers, and eventually tropical cyclone development. And uh, the opposite would be La Nina, when the winds along the equator become easterly and pushes all that warm water into the far western Pacific. So some other uh, common tropical and atmospheric hazards and our relevant uh, National Weather Service programs, uh, we'll just dive into these real quick. Uh, we see hazardous surf uh, quite often throughout the year. In the dry season, we see hazardous surf that is generated uh, from strong trade wind surges that tends to affect the eastern shores of the islands and atolls across Micronesia and the Marianas. Uh, but in the wet season, uh, we can see really strong uh, frontal systems well north of us off of Japan. They can push a northwest swell into the region, uh, but more notoriously are the tropical cyclones. And as a tropical cyclone approaches the islands and the atolls, uh, we see seas starting to build up uh, along with surf. And some of the problems with that are major coastal erosion it could affect some infrastructure along the coast. Uh, this picture up in the top left, uh, that is across uh, the Marshall Islands. And they are particularly vulnerable to uh, high surf and uh, coastal inundation, especially at times of high tide. We see high sea conditions. And when we issue uh, small craft advisories or uh, other advisories for gale warnings and high seas, uh, these are the times that uh, boaters definitely would want to stay in port not venturing out. Um, we see the, the leeward side of the islands that are protected from the winds and the largest swell. Uh, they look uh, deceptively small, but once you get out of the shadow of the islands, the sea conditions become uh, quickly uh, worse. And, and that's when you see boaters encounter some major problems. We see this across parts of Micronesia uh, where they're protected in the lagoons and then boaters will come out of the lagoons and then are just quickly overwhelmed uh, by the uh, deteriorated sea conditions. Um, recently, we've been see hearing about funnel clouds, uh, water spouts, and, and that type of uh, phenomenon. Uh, so here we have the funnel clouds on the left. Uh, funnel clouds are just funnels that are rotating uh, that don't reach the ground or the ocean surface. Uh, we see these quite often in the, in the wet season when we don't have strong winds across the region, uh, just a little bit of atmospheric instability. And then you see these funnels just uh, reaching down like fingers out of the bottom of the cloud tops or out of the cloud bases. 
and uh, they may last for a few minutes before retreating back up into the cloud, or they may uh, uh, last a little bit longer and extend down to the surface. These tend to be more fair weather uh, rotation uh, funnels uh, because we're looking at uh, light wind patterns and the funnels just form out of that little bit of a vorticity, that spin in the atmosphere. Uh, but the more pronounced actually develop into water spouts. That's one when they kind of hit the ocean surface. Uh, last year on Guam, uh, we actually had one over the island. Um, I, I believe it did make surface, uh, it hit the surface. And, and in that case, it would be referred to as a land spout. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, disagreement in some communities on whether these should be considered tornadoes or, or not. The difference is a tornado, as you see in the United States, uh, those are related to supercell thunderstorms, uh, much more violent and can have winds 100 to 300 miles per hour. And, but those across the tropics tend to be much weaker, uh, maybe 40 to 60 miles per hour. Yes, they will do some damage if they come on shore, uh, but not uh, as long lasting and not nearly as violent as those in the US. Now, as we go into the, the story of lightning, uh, this is not anywhere in the tropics. This is my hometown in North Carolina. We had a really good thunderstorm one night and uh, and I'm always uh, in love with thunderstorms and managed to capture some great lightning. Here, here's some statistics. These are uh, uh, statistics uh, uh, accumulated from across the United States from 2006 to 2015. Uh, fatalities based on leisure activities. Uh, a number, uh, a vast uh, number of those are related to water activities and can you imagine what we have a lot of out here in the marianas yes water activities we're, we're catering to the tourism and uh so there's a particular vulnerability to water related fatalities out here and we've had a couple of incidents uh, where people fishing out in the on the reefs uh, have had lightning strike near the, by them and then they've they've been killed because of that out of the water related activities Fishing accounted for 46% of the deaths. Uh, beach, 25%. Swimming and boating uh, for another small share of that. And, and I definitely, for anybody that's connected to the tourism industry out here, uh, it's something to make you think about uh, when the Weather Service is issuing any type of thunderstorm advisory, or it, even if you're not connected to the internet and you see these dark clouds, if you can hear thunder, if you see lightning, you are at risk. And uh, a lot of the tourism, uh, focuses on the water activities, especially the parasailing. And, and basically, you've got this high-flying kite that's uh, 50 to 60, who knows how, how high up, and they're just begging to, to be attracted by the lightning. So if you see these dark clouds, if you see lightning, hear thunder, uh, definitely take a break, head on in, and, and protect, uh, protect your assets, the people, and the tourists. And we want the tourism industry to be thriving and not known for uh, serious incidents. So how can you tell how far lightning is from you? Well, if you see the flash and you count the seconds until you hear the thunder, uh, lightning travels very fast at the speed of light. Uh, that's insanely fast, 186,000 miles per second. And on the contrary, thunder is very slow. It's, it's practically surprising that thunder even gets to you as slow as it is crawling at only 620 miles per hour. Uh, but fortunately, every five seconds after that lightning, uh, thunder travels one mile. So if uh, you saw a flash of lightning, it was 25 seconds till you heard thunder, then that lightning was five miles away. Ultimately, when thunder roars, get indoors. It's best to be safe. If you can't get into a building, your car is a very safe place. Uh, people think the, the tires being rubber is what protects you. That is just an urban legend, uh, but what protects you is that metal cage that you're sitting in that is a framing of your car. And when lightning hits the car, that, that electricity flows around you and down into the ground. So a car is a great place to be. Now for fire weather, uh, we've had a number of fires this past dry season across Guam, and we've, I've actually seen some of the records out of Saipan of fires occurring uh, in the first half of the year. Uh, we do have a fire program that's uh, geared toward Guam, and, uh, but we also kind of reach out to our partners up in the CNMI, uh, especially when we, when we are issuing any type of uh, fire-related product. Our red flag program 
is basically to alert land management and fire agencies to conditions that would be uh, see increasing chance of dangerously spreading fast spreading wildfires. So we're not forecasting fires to occur, but we're forecasting the, the conditions in which fires that have developed may spread very quickly and become very hard to control. Uh, typical fire suppression uh, relies on fire trucks, firemen, uh, just spraying the fires. And the worst case scenarios that we're concerned about are those conditions in which fire trucks and the typical uh, hosing the fires just does not work. When we may have to see uh, fire agencies reaching out to the DOD for helicopters to kind of do an aerial attack on the fires. Those are the conditions that we're looking for and those are what we're forecasting uh, with our red flag warnings. There was a question. Which yeah, uh, we got a question. Uh, are, go ahead, Jimmy. Are those 71 cases of water-related lightning fatalities worldwide or what region? Uh, good question. Are those 70-some uh, cases of lightning fatalities worldwide or in what region? Those are U.S.-based fatalities. So that would be the, the, the continental U.S. and its territories. Um, as an aside, when we have a lightning death out here in the Marianas, we do report that up to the National Weather Service headquarters, and that does get incorporated into the national uh, databases. And Ambrose from Red Cross also mentioned that when he worked at the hotel there, that there was a young lady that was hit by lightning while in the sea in two months. Okay, Ambrose Constantino mentioned uh, working at the hotel in the past, and a uh, woman was swimming in Tuman Bay and was struck. Uh, yes, uh, we're always scouring uh, local media, uh, both here on Guam, the CNMI, and Micronesia. Uh, when we see any type of uh, weather-related incident, uh, that's something that we report up to National Weather Service headquarters uh, because it, it feeds into the data. And, and ultimately, we, we take every incident, every death, whether it's from lightning, uh, whether it's uh, rip current-based, high surf-based, uh, or even boaters on the open ocean, uh, we, we look at those and we try to see if there's any way we can improve our messaging, how we can reach out to our partners and ultimately our goal is to save life and property uh, through the way we issue our products and our warnings and advisories. So good questions, thank you. And uh, so yes, our red flag warnings, basically we communicate to the fire agencies and our forestry partners uh, to help them uh, assess how they can uh, manage their personnel and resources to properly respond uh, to more serious conditions. So. We have three text products that we issue in the dry season from roughly from uh, November through June or July. We issue a fire weather forecast every day uh, around 10 to 11 in the morning. This is just calling to attention uh, what kind of chances for rain, whether it's going to be dry, windy or not, uh, and, and a seven day outlook. Basically, what kind of weather can we expect and how will it affect uh, the dry conditions and the relationship to fires? When we start seeing conditions developing for uh, increased risk of uh, fast spreading wildfires, we issued a fire weather watch. This could be any time with a 12 to 48 hour lead time. So two days in advance, we could say, hey, we're looking at very dry conditions. Uh, we're expecting a trade wind surge in two days that may make fires more difficult to control. And then when it has happened, when those conditions are met, uh, we'll issue a red flag warning. That means conditions are favorable for fast spreading wildfires that will be difficult to control. So a watch is a lookout, it's possible, and a warning is this is it, it's expected, uh, and, and be prepared. So some of our fire danger categories, we've recently revamped our fire weather program. We used to have four, four categories, but now we've gone to five uh, and ultimately reducing the time that we're in the extreme category. But uh, in the wet season, we tend to stay in the low to moderate categories. So fires can occur no matter which category we're in. Uh, a few years ago, I was looking at statistics from uh, Saipan and I was noticing how so many fires occur all around the year, even in the wet season. But uh, the, re the reporting conditions, the smallest wildfires are reported as a quarter acre or less. And when I started plotting the locations of these fires, they tended to gravitate toward the neighborhoods. Uh, so I, my suspicion is that they could be uh, maybe people burning trash and then the fires 
get loose just a little bit, but they're quickly contained because of the ambient wet conditions. But we're looking for those big fires that spread uh, in Saipan uh, along Wireless Ridge near Capitol Hill, uh, upslope fires that spread very quickly. And, and those tend to happen more often in the very high or the extreme categories. And when that happens, we are communicating uh, on Facebook, on our social media platforms, and with all of our partners. Uh, some brief descriptions uh, of what these categories mean. And uh, for the extreme, note that fires can spread furiously and every fire has a potential to become very large. And, uh, and that's what we try to look for. Um, and then we issue our, our watches and warnings. Now on the opposite of the dry season, we have the hydrology program. Uh, it's most notoriously used in the wet season when we have more rain and heavier rain. Uh, there's a number of products that we issue across the top, urban and small stream flood advisory. We've actually had quite a few of those recently on Guam and even a couple for Saipan and Tinian. We're looking for heavy rain uh, over a period of one to two hours that will cause some flooding around the islands. Uh, this flooding is usually nuisance flooding, uh, not long lived, but it will cause you to maybe have to come up with a couple of detours on some of the roads. And we see thunderstorms, longer lasting convective outbreaks that lead to these conditions. Now note, these are all uh, advisories, watches and warnings. We issue the flash flood warning in the urban and small stream flood advisory in response to the conditions being met. These are not forecast products. These are not forecasts that we issue in advance, but these are advisories that we issue when we have detected, when we have observed rain gauges showing heavy rainfall, and then we issue these advisories. Um, but our, AF, our forecast discussion, uh, we call it the AFD, Area Forecast Discussion, and our other forecasts, we give those uh, precedents for leading into these events. Now, when we're expecting a monsoon surge, a tropical cyclone to affect the Marianas, we issue a hydrologic outlook. This can be issued two to four days in advance. And basically, we're just saying, we're watching the system potentially developing, could threaten the Marianas. We're expecting, uh, expecting a certain amount of large precipitation that could cause some flooding issues. This is a good heads up for the different mayor's offices. I know the personnel will go through the villages looking at the storm drains and uh, they do a pretty good job uh, cleaning those out to, to prepare for uh, heavy rainfall amounts. Uh, when we see uh, a, a typhoon is becoming more, more probable, we'll issue a flash flood watch. We could see a large amount of rain in the, about a 12 to 24 hours or so. And then a flash flood warning when it's either imminent just before or when it has occurred. But ultimately, we reach out to our partners at uh, the Homeland Security offices in Saipan and here on Guam to communicate these growing threats. And then we also rely on our social media platforms and our media partners to basically have a, a multi-pronged approach to getting information to the public. So here's a, some examples of urban and small stream. Uh, some nuisance flooding here up on the top left, that's uh, the notorious area of PD. Uh, that air place there always floods. You could have a sprinkle and you might have some standing water. <laughs> and then I think this one up on the top right is Ordot Chalampago. Uh, just off of Route 4. Uh, that place is a little bit more notorious for flooding when we have some, uh, some slow-moving showers. Flash flood warning, we see increasing impacts. Uh, houses are flooding. Uh, I, I know recently in Guam on August 27th, uh, we saw some pretty widespread flooding. Parts of Agate and Pneumatic, Mariso, and Arahan were impassable. Uh, this image in the middle, that's in Pago Bay. Sometimes we see that road completely blocked. And ultimately, the slogan is, uh, when uh, turn around, don't drown. And uh, for all of our partners, both on Guam and uh, CNMI, if you, uh, if you see any flooding, if you experience flooding rains, uh, we like to have some pictures. If you can safely take them, don't, don't go through raging waters because you, you can't ever know for sure that perhaps uh, the water has eroded the road bed. And then this car driving through might just kind of wash out and then you're, you're dealing with a life or death situation. But if you can safely get pictures, please send those to us either on social media 
um, private messages or in, uh, on our emails, which we'll have flashed up at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, but we, we look for uh, pictures of the impacts of the hazardous weather uh, that we can supplement in future slides. Uh, after widespread rainfall, we see the risk of mudslides increasing. These are some pictures from Chuuk uh, on the left side. And a couple ingredients that you need for mudslides are clay-based soil, heavy rain, and steep terrain. Uh, heavy rain can't be just one single burst of rain, but it needs to be a prolonged rain that thoroughly saturates the soil. Uh, most vulnerable areas tend to be in the mountainous areas, uh, places where slides have occurred before. Uh, but the bedrock has not been exposed and areas where vegetation has been removed. And sometimes that could be where recent wildfires have occurred. It's destroyed all the vegetation and now you're dealing with dirt that is just ready to be slumped down the, uh, the hillside. Uh, rainfall, we need a lot of rain uh, and 10 inches per day. That, that can happen once in a while with a monsoon surge, uh, with a massive convective outbreak or even typhoons. Uh, but ultimately, we want that steady and, and continuous rainfall. Uh, and when we start seeing the conditions become favorable for mudslides, we will issue a special weather statement. We will be reaching out to all of our government partners and uh, social media and be posting uh, stuff with the media. And uh, so we have a lower threshold that will start elevating our uh, concern uh, for these events. One of the more deadliest uh, weather occurrences out here are rip currents. Uh, as surf builds along the reefs, water builds up on the bays, and that water has to escape back out to the ocean. And we tend to see the, uh, the rip currents always in the same spots uh, through the little cuts in the reef. And uh, the, the reefs don't change that much. Uh, in the U.S., we see sandbars form. They, they, they move, they shift around with the currents. Out here, the reefs are pretty solid. They're fixed in place. And so the rip currents tend to always be in the same spot but they can still be just as deadly when people are caught off guard. And, and so here you have the ocean waves breaking onto the shore, onto the reef, and then the water in the bays on the reef has to go out through the narrow, deeper cuts in the reef. And these, these currents can be fairly strong. It is impossible to swim against them. Uh, you can see the rip currents, usually in the churning choppy water, uh, you have nice form waves coming on the reef, except for where the rip currents are breaking into them. And uh, so they're very dangerous. Uh, here's an example off of uh, Agana Bay behind the Sheraton Hotel. Uh, we have large uh, nine to 11 foot surf coming onto the reef and that water is piling up in the bay and the water follows the yellow arrows around the reef and it's got to come out through this little cut. Uh, sometimes I've seen paddle boarders out here. It looks fun but it is deadly and, uh, and you can see that, that milky colored water where all that, uh, that filth, the, uh, the dirt from the reef is blowing out into the open ocean. Easiest way to get out is just swim a couple of meters either side and you're out of that current. At that point, it's just a matter of hoping somebody sees you, hint, hint, buddy system when you're out swimming or you can just try your luck and go over the reef, but I can guarantee you it does not have uh, good consequences. So always play it safe when dealing with the water. Now, some of the marine products we issue, here's our routine forecast. These are updated every 12 hours at the least. Sometimes we'll update those even more frequently. You have the Marianas Coastal Forecast, that is for waves, seas, and swells, that's for our boaters. And then our surf zone forecast for rip currents, uh, surf heights in the different direction facing reefs, and the possibility of lightning. Then we have our event-driven beach hazards. When we start seeing the seas are pretty large, uh, creating larger surf, nine feet or 15 feet are benchmarked for hazardous surf and high surf warnings, uh, we'll be issuing high surf advisories. These are event-driven. And then for the sea conditions, when uh, uh, ocean swells and combined seas or winds uh, exceed a certain level, 10 feet or 22 knot winds, we will be issuing these advisories, these small craft and gale warnings. Again, there's a difference between our routine forecast and our event-driven hazards. As we move into the more global nature events, earthquakes, uh, we see those happen quite often along all the fault lines. 
Uh, we have the Marianas Trench right east of the Marianas and notorious for earthquakes. Uh, it is not uncommon that we see uh, a small earthquake of about a four or five magnitude in our area. And, uh, but ultimately, the faults are always moving. And over time, as the force and the pressure builds, uh, the fault becomes deformed until finally they erupt and you get an earthquake. Uh, we've been fortunate uh, in the past couple of decades not to have any significant earthquakes, uh, but it's, it's always a matter of time so that happens. Uh, size, uh, earthquake uh, folks, the, uh, uh, we're looking at seismograms to detect earthquakes and we need multiple seismometers to show that earthquake and scientists will use uh, triangulation to find out exactly where the earthquakes are. Uh, you need three at the least, uh, but the more seismometers that, uh, that pick up the earthquakes, the better your positioning. We have two scales that we uh, assess for the intensity of an earthquake. The Mercalli uh, is a subjective based on how did you, how, how was the experience for you? Was it major shaking? Was there any damage? Any cracks in the concrete wall? Uh, lights shaking? Uh, ranges from 1 to 12, with the 12 being buildings nearly destroyed. The more objective-based uh, measurement is a Richter magnitude scale, which is uh, the more common that you see in the news. And that is a logarithmic scale, meaning that a 7 earthquake is 10 times larger than a 6 and so on to an eight is 10 times larger than a seven, but the impacts are 30 times more per category uh, per magnitude earthquake. Uh, we have computers at our weather office that uh, monitor for earthquakes around the world. Uh, we, this was a, a picture of all the aftershocks off of Japan in uh, 2011, the Tohoku uh, earthquake that uh, did generate a tsunami for the Marianas. And then, uh, how appropriate we go into tsunamis. Um, we see the tsunamis occurring across the Pacific uh, once or twice every couple of years. Fortunately, most are not uh, devastating, um, but uh, we are concerned because we do have a risk for local or distant tsunamis. And most of those tsunamis do occur from earthquakes. So we do not issue any advisories or products uh, out of the National Weather Service but we tend to forward those products from the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. And what we're really concerned for are the tsunami watches and warnings about the, the, the possibility of a potentially destructive tsunami within six hours for the watch or within three hours for the warning. Once we have any type of uh, tsunami bulletin issued, we will be very quickly contact all of our government partners because sometimes if there's a true threat, uh, the government officials have to go into action mode and, and consider evacuations. So the most important thing in this chart is the public response. If there's a local tsunami threat, well, you're going to feel that earthquake. As soon as that shaking stops, violent shaking that could last a couple of minutes, if you're along the coast in the low-lying areas, you need to get to higher ground and well inland uh, from rivers that flow out right into the ocean. Uh, there's no time to wait for any type of uh, uh, text products. If there's a regional tsunami, some, uh, an earthquake, uh, maybe right off of uh, the Philippines, uh, Japan, there's going to be a little bit more time to respond to assess the buoys by the uh, Pacific Tsunami Warning Center to see if there truly is a threat of a tsunami. And then a distant tsunami, you could have three, six hours, maybe even a day to respond. But ultimately, action, uh, action uh, decisions are made by the local governments. And, uh, and then we will communicate with the local government officials uh, and, and then they will make the decisions based off of our uh, mutual interactions. So we can identify the potential for a destructive tsunami, but we can't always tell whether a tsunami will be destructive or not. And, and there's a lot of uncertainties. We have to overwarn because of that risk. Uh, there are no second chances. So, uh, some facts in history. There have been some tsunamis that have caused damage. Uh, some uh, local studies have shown, uh, have shown a few occurrences. Uh, 2011's earthquake in Japan, uh, that was about a three-foot uh, tsunami for Saipan. Uh, here on, on Guam, it was about 18 inches. Uh, the coral islands tend not to see too much of a risk of major tsunamis, uh, but uh, 
the tsunami behavior tends to look like a high to low tide uh, changeover that just happens over a period of 30 minutes to an hour versus uh, uh, a five to six hour progression of the tides. Uh, boaters, uh, Navy officials, they, they are, are well aware that the best place to be uh, for tsunami is in the high seas, out in the open ocean, away from the islands, uh, away from the harbor entrances and the bays. That's where we can see some strong currents. Tsunami waves can be multiple waves, not just the first or the second wave. Sometimes the first wave is not the biggest. So we're assessing the buoys. We're working with Pacific Tsunami Warning Center and then also with local government to uh, on when to make that all clear decision. So here's some of the earthquakes around the world in the past hundred years that have created tsunamis. And then those who have led to deaths more than 600 miles from the earthquake epicenter. So not as many of those, but they can be some big ones. And those are ones that we are truly concerned about. Our tsunami sources, Marianas Trench, very local. Uh, a lot of people say the Marianas Trench is what protects us from tsunamis. That is a complete myth. Uh, Marianas Trench being a fault line is a source of earthquakes and uh, we will feel that shaking. We have no time to wait for any type of bulletin. We just have to know to react and get higher ground. Uh, earthquakes near Japan, uh, Philippines will take three to four hours off of Kamchatka Peninsula, Russia, five to six, and then off to Washington coast, uh, west coast of the US, South America, 11 to 12 hours or longer. In America, Samoa, uh, 11 years ago, uh, they had the opinion that we can't have a destructive tsunami because the water is just too deep. The Tonga Trench, pretty close by, it just sucks away that tsunami energy. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, a little bit. I've heard that many times here on Guam. Well, in uh, September 2009, there was a large earthquake and uh, a number of people passed away uh, due to the flooding. Uh, the death toll would have been quite a bit higher had the PTWC uh, not had training just two months prior and the mayors on the island knew what to do. They were going around with the loudspeakers, get to higher ground, get to higher ground, saved a lot of lives. Now, as we go into volcanoes, the Marianas has quite a few volcanoes. There is a Surigan. Uh, at 2011 on the right, there were some underwater volcanic eruptions. Uh, these clouds actually got up to about 30, 40,000 feet. We could see it in satellite imagery. Uh, there is a risk for volcanic ash and haze, uh, some thunderstorms. Uh, maybe a, a strong eruption underwater could generate a tsunami. Uh, we would not know about it until we just happen to experience the changing water conditions. So there is a, a risk. Some of our threats, uh, we got local threats, regional, and then uh, more Pacific wide threats. Hawaii, well, just a couple years ago, we had the haze coming from uh, Kilauea volcano. And then 2003, Anatol Hansa eruption. Um, haze is not particularly hazardous to aviation like ash is, um, but it can have respiratory issues for many people. Uh, we can see acid rain and uh, ultimately it's best just to stay inside. Concentration of gases, gases is not particularly high, uh, but you would definitely smell it. And fortunately, our trade winds uh, in the trade wind season tends to push that ash toward the west and away from our islands. This was a picture of Typhoon Chan home many years ago. Uh, typhoon is well northeast of the Marianas, but uh, Anatahan in 2003, when it had an explosion, uh, it created an ash cloud that went right over Saipan and Tinian, and uh, the airports had to be closed for a little while. We use the radar and satellite imagery to look for any type of eruption. Our first inclination will be satellite imagery. If we see clouds forming uh, through a non weather thunderstorm event that just sticks in place, uh, that's the heads up for us at the weather office, what's going on. And then we can use radar and satellite to look at those, uh, to assess it. And then we're, we're talking with our volcanic uh, monitoring uh, counterparts in Washington. I got one question. Yes, got a question. Should all coastal residents evacuate based on the tsunami warning? Is the evacuation order for mayors? Well, that's a good question. Uh, should all coastal residents evacuate for tsunamis or is the decision for mayors? Well, the, we're gonna be working with the government offices and then that word will trickle down into the mayor's offices and to the various islands of the CNMI. Uh, the governors will make the official declaration 
uh, but the the civil defense and homeland security offices they have uh, got materials on different vulnerability areas uh, on uh, particularly who should be evacuating um, but it is one thing that we have definitely noticed in past tsunami events that even if a tsunami is approaching from say the east side of the island the tsunami can affect the west side of the islands the way the wave travels around and envelops the islands so it's something that is a concern for everybody and and ultimately i say rely on the civil defense managers the governor's office to make those decisions and uh, and we'll be working with them very closely in regards but ultimately it's very important to know your flood zone how high above sea level are you and and then where you should evacuate to there's a we have a tsunami preparedness stuff uh, with signage that uh, directs people to higher ground, uh, especially in uh, Tumon and Tamuni, we have some signage, and then also in parts of southern Guam where we have the low-lying coastal areas. But ultimately, know the difference between an advisory and a tsunami warning. Uh, basically, that relates to the timing of, of arrival. The warning, you've got less than three hours, and, uh, and then the watch is for six. Now, as I get close to wrapping things up for my portion, I want to dabble a little bit in the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And uh, we, all, we call that colloquially as ENSO. That is basically the atmosphere ocean system uh, of the Pacific. Uh, where are the warm waters? What are the winds doing across the Pacific? Uh, we're looking at sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, sea surface temperature helps us see what the temperature is, of course, but we want to see the anomalies to better identify the change where that warm water is. Think of that uh, stovetop burner. Where is the burner located in the ocean surface? If it's out to the central and west or central and east, we're looking at El Nino. If it's off to the west, we're looking at La Nina. So El Nino, that is the warm phase. The burner is in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, we're seeing nature redistributing the excess heat to central and eastern Pacific. We see stronger west winds. West winds are problematic for the Micronesian Islands because uh, they, they are a little bit more vulnerable with some of their ports and their low-lying areas. Uh, they're not used to west winds. They're used to the prevailing trade winds out of the east. La Nina is the opposite. That is where they burner the warm water shift to the far west. That is a cold phase because the Central and Eastern Pacific tend to cool off quite a bit and we have much stronger trade winds uh, across the equatorial Pacific. And so neutral is simply that intermediate phase between the El Nino and the La Nina. So again, here's our normal conditions. Uh, we see trade winds across the equatorial Pacific. Uh, the trade winds at the surface just push that warmer water, that uh, burner, goes into the West Pacific and the warm water and the sea surface uh, heights also tend to increase. All the west, the easterly winds pushing the water to the west and the sea, sur uh, sea, temp uh, sea heights increase in the far west. As we go into the El Nino, well, all of a sudden we have west winds at the equator. We see an increased threat of tropical cyclones. All the cloud and shower thunderstorm development shifts to the central and Eastern Pacific, and all of a sudden, the waters are lowering in the West Pacific and rising in the East Pacific. And then La Nina, the opposite, those trade winds really start surging back pretty strongly across the equatorial Pacific. The warm waters go to the far west. The showers and thunderstorms push well to the west, and we see the, the typhoon development shifting well west and that ultimately reduces the risk for the Marianas and Eastern Micronesia. A little bit of the, the typical return rates. We see a weak El Nino roughly every three to five years. Uh, we see a moderate El Nino every seven to 10 years. And then those strong El Ninos uh, every 15 to 30 years. These uh, temperature anomalies, those are measured in the Central Pacific along the equator. And uh, doesn't look very much, one and a half degrees Celsius, but that is significant in a, weather, in a weather pattern to see where those anomalies are and what, uh, what that does regionally for the weather patterns. Uh, 1997 was a very strong El Nino. 
and 2015 was a strong El Nino. So just to recap, El Nino is not a, there's no set periodicity frequency of occurrence. The stronger an El Nino, the worse the impacts. And the El Nino has a wet and a dry period. And uh, as I said before, whatever period you're in could affect sea levels up to two feet in some areas in the far west and the far east. So what we're looking for El Nino is we're looking for a month of sea surface temperature anomaly of more than a half degree Celsius and is expected to persist for at least three months. And a La Nina is virtually the opposite, a, a decrease of sea surface temperature uh, of uh, half degree Celsius for a month and is expected to continue for three continuous months. Right now, we're uh, sitting in a La Nina watch. So we're expecting to see La Nina conditions for the next several months. And uh, Lena will have more to divulge with that shortly. So wet period El Ninos, west winds, more monsoon, TC development, tropical cyclone development shifts eastward and lower sea levels in the west. Uh, that means that low tides, we could actually see more of the reef exposed as well. Uh, El Nino dry periods, droughts can be prolonged and more severe. We see our transition to wet season around June on average. This transition could wait until July or August extending that period of dry, dry and drought and more wildfires. Fire danger is enhanced. Some islands, especially the shallow islands, uh, the, the low-lying islands, coral atolls across Micronesia, see their drinking water severely depleted and that could have some major health effects. Trade winds increase, sea levels will rise. You see increased coastal flooding, especially with any type of uh, disturbance coming through. And sometimes this has a, a, a negative effect on food sources, uh, fruits and vegetables that people grow. It may take eight to 10 months or longer for some of these uh, uh, sources to replenish. So here, here's a, a one more recap. Uh, many locations can have a wet spring between January and April. Uh, 2011 uh, flashes in my mind. We had a dry season that just was not very dry. We had no fire danger risk that uh, dry season. It was so wet. Marianas can be wet or dry, and that TC activity is pushed westward. And we see a changing threat for the Marianas in eastern Micronesia. And, uh, and then larger seas, larger swell and surf, and trade winds in the dry phase. And ultimately, as I close, here's the 1997-1998 difference in tropical cyclone development. So 1997 is, is uh, shown with the triangles. Uh, the triangles show where the tropical cyclones developed and El Nino, you can see there, there's a few in the far western Pacific, but look at how many formed near Chuk, Hanpei, Koshrai, and Majuro. All the storms forming in that area are a potential serious threat for the Marianas. And, and Lena will show some more about the typical motion of these storms. But then in 1998, the, the dry phase of the El Nino uh, stronger trade winds, all those storms developed in 1998 as the black dots were much farther to the west, a significantly reduced threat for the Marianas. And, and that's kind of what we're seeing this year as a reduced threat, as the Atlantic has been extremely busy making the, the news rounds. Uh, the West Pacific has been notoriously uh, less busy. And uh, with that said, I am going to turn it over to Landon and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask those. Uh, uh, Jenny will be uh, keeping track of those and will be asking away. So with that, here's Landon. Hey, thank you, Brandon. Um, I, I gotta say it's quite a pleasure to work with my twin brother. I think we are the only twin brothers working in the same National Weather Service office in the United States. So it makes work a lot more easy and we're a great team. So um, thank you, Brandon, for covering that. I'm gonna talk about the tropical cyclones and we have so much information, so many details and just to discuss tropical cyclones, our typhoon history and vulnerability here on the islands. And we have such a short amount of time and thank you, Brandon, for covering all those other hazards. Um, as we all know, the tropical cyclones, they get the bulk of attention and publicity here in the region, and Brandon did a great job discussing a lot of our other natural hazards that do cause problems here in the islands and are often overlooked uh, for 
favoritism towards the bigger problems like the tropical cyclones. So back to the El Nino, La Nina discussion. This is our tropical cyclone genesis region typical of La Nina uh, versus El Nino. And as Brendan mentioned, tropical cyclones can and do form farther east across Eastern Micronesia and the Marshall Islands in an El Nino pattern. That's indicative of our 2015 where we had tropical storm Bobby in March and Typhoon Dolphin that went right through the Rota Channel in May. Um, this year is far different. We've had one of our slowest seasons and I think 2010 was the slowest typhoon season on record. Uh, 2005, um, we're fighting for that honor right now. We've only had 14 tropical cyclones at this point this year in the West Pacific and we expect slow conditions to continue. So with that said, that's, a, that's great news for us and our warning partners across the islands in this time of COVID because if we were dealing with the 2015 season where we had tropical cyclones all through the year and one after another hitting the islands, that would be quite a headache for our warning partners, our sheltering folks and the medical uh, partners in the region. So thank you for our current condition. So where are we now? We are in a La Nina advisory, which means La Nina conditions are present. Uh, that's below average sea surface temperatures, atmospheric circulation anomalies are present and consistent with La Nina. And so we expect these conditions to continue in the coming months. So looking at current forecast models and forecaster consensus, uh, this is where we are. We are below average sea surface temperatures and the forecast models do show us maintaining this condition at least through the fall and early winter months. Um, some forecasters think we could have a brief um, period at a moderate La Nina episode before things start going back towards the ENSO neutral pattern in the spring and early summer next year. That's still very far down the road. Um, so we're gonna be watching that every month as these models adjust with the new data. But for now, we are looking at a, a definitely a weak La Nina to continue through the fall and early winter, possibly into a moderate La Nina um, as we approach the Christmas season. So once we get to the tropical cyclones, um, again, we're looking at a below average season and that is the good news for us. But some of the topics we're gonna to discuss today are the tropical cyclone characteristics, how they behave and the various hazards with these uh, systems, uh, the triple threat, and then our tropical cyclone program products and our timing. And a lot of these are routine products um, and then some of those short fused or event driven bulletins that Brandon mentioned earlier, they'll come in sequence with a tropical cyclone program. So why are we here? Well, we are here because we have selected our jobs, our careers to be in a public capacity to help people. Um, and I'm, I think of this saying by Winston Churchill, let our advanced worrying become advanced thinking and planning. Tropical cyclones and typhoons are a way of life for us here in the islands. Is that something you should worry about? Not necessarily. We should use that worry and put it towards planning and thinking in an active sense. And that's what we all do over here. We didn't come to our positions against our will. We selected these jobs because it's what our interests are. That's what we want to do. And we have this need to help the public. So. Again, let our advanced worrying become advanced thinking and planning. So what exactly is a tropical cyclone? Well, it's a large area of organized rotating clouds with warm, low pressure center, and it usually forms over the tropical waters uh, for us in Micronesia. It's the low level clouds rotate counterclockwise in the Northern Hemisphere and clockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. And a tropical cyclone, that's just a overarching term that includes everything from tropical depressions, uh, that's the weakest of these systems, sustained winds of 38 miles per hour or less, to a tropical storm, and those are with winds of 39 to 73 miles per hour, and then they intensify into a typhoon, which is 74 miles per hour or greater. A typhoon reaches super typhoon status once it reaches 150 miles per hour or greater, and these are sustained winds, not wind gusts, but sustained winds, which are average winds over a one minute period. Um, tropical cyclones do come in many different shapes and sizes. And so just because this typhoon may be very large, doesn't mean it's gonna be the strongest 
that you'll ever see because some of these smaller typhoons can be very small but very intense. And our friends up in the CNMI, they experienced that uh, full force uh, a few years ago with Typhoon Sudalar. Um, so again, weak or strong tropical cyclones, they can be large or small, but it is important to note that the larger systems affect a much larger area, a broader area. So if we have, a, let's say Typhoon Sudalar went right over Saipan, Tinian didn't feel many effects of it other than that, that monsoonal tail that generated the gusty winds and the showers and thunderstorms over Tinian and also down towards Guam and uh, Rota. But if Sudalar had been a much larger tropical cyclone, um, the effects would have been felt greater over not just Saipan, but Tinian, Rota, and Guam. So every storm is different and we have to take that into effect because these larger tropical cyclones, they will affect a much larger area and everybody will feel the effects of those. So keep that in mind. Uh, a lot of people say, well, well, this storm's only in category ones and we've dealt with a category two or three. The effects of each typhoon should be considered separately and planned with the importance and utmost respect for nature because the microscale effects can vary significantly from storm to storm. And again, this is super typhoon U2 versus Sudalar. So notice the differences in the size. Um, U2 was much larger and fully enveloped uh, the island of Tinian and the eye wall went over southern Saipan, whereas Sudalor, basically the entire eye wall fit on the island of Saipan, encompassed by the, the southern shores and the northern shores. So size does have a significant uh, weighting factor in how we communicate and uh, how the effects are felt. And then here's another comparison. Brandon mentioned Super Typhoon Tip. I believe that was in the 1970s. It was one of the largest typhoons in recorded history. And it filled up most of the Philippines Sea with the effects felt in the Philippines as well as in the Mariana Islands. And then you have Super Typhoon U2 over there in Tennessee, um, considerably smaller, and then Sudolor, um, a very small midget cyclone. So what are the ingredients for tropical cyclones? Well, you need a pre-existing disturbance, warm ocean water, and light upper level winds with little or no shear. And we can have these any time of the year. So a lot of times people refer to our typhoon season as the summer and fall months, but it's important to realize that typhoons can and do occur any time around the year. And we do have a small climatological peak in tropical cyclones around April and May. Um, typhoon Wutip, that was a prime example in 2019. That one developed in Pompeii and Chuuk states um, in February of 2019. And that went through Chuuk state, Eastern Yap state, and then grazed uh, Southern Guam, and then later became a super typhoon. Um, so again, they can and do occur around the year. Now, a lot of people focus on the Saffir Simpson wind scale for typhoons for the intensity, but there is more to the category than the um, the winds. There's more to the story than the category, and that is the winds, the storm surge, and the heavy rain. And the biggest killer historically by typhoons and tropical cyclones are the associated storm surge. It's the water factor. So we're going to start with the winds. Um, there's a lot of science and studies to the winds and how they cause structural damage. Um, they act in two ways, differential pressures on the exterior, and then also the wind-borne debris. So this is where we want to ask people to take in loose items, take out, uh, remove items that's laying in the yard that could be wind blown debris. Um, and they contribute a lot of the damage. If you double the wind speed, the wind's force increases four times, and then the effects of the wind gusts increase nine times. And the terrain also plays an effect. Uh, the wind gusts with a tropical cyclone, they're pretty much um, consistent no matter where you are on a, a landmass, whether it's at the coastal plain or in the mountains, but funneling of winds through valleys and between high-rise buildings, that does have an effect as well as frictional effects of the land. So this is from a, a study on the Venturi effect um, of winds associated with a tropical cyclone over the land. So keep that in mind. You notice if you're walking through a, a dense area of high-rise buildings, the winds can come and gust um, through the streets, and that's something to take into effect. That's why Chicago is called the Windy City. 
And types of wind damage, it's, it varies significantly on the wind speeds. Um, that's why we have reinforced concrete houses and structures across the islands, because this is realistically the best way to survive um, intense storms here in the islands. We cannot evacuate uh, like they do in the States. Now the general motion of typhoons and tropical cyclones, that does play a factor uh, in your wind expectations. For us, because of the Earth's spin and shape, tropical cyclones tend to move toward the Northwest in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and deviations can and do occur based on steering currents. That could be like a subtropical ridge that keeps the tropical cyclone more pressed to the south before gaining that latitude, um, or the monsoonal currents that establishes across the Philippines and Western and sometimes Eastern Micronesia. So the steering currents do play a big factor, but generally, uh, tropical cyclones move from southeast to northwest, and that puts us in a prime zone as Typhoon Alley when these things start developing in eastern Micronesia. Now, as far as the wind expectations, let's say this typhoon here in the picture is moving right over uh, the Rota Channel. If you have a 90 mile per hour storm moving at 10 miles per hour, the island of Rota could see winds up to 100 miles per hour, but Guam would see lesser winds because that forward motion uh, counteracts with the winds on the southwest side and adds to the northeast side. And so that does play a role um, in expectations for what kind of winds to expect over a certain location. So again, that's the right side of the storm. The storm surge, again, that's the, the historically the biggest killer and tropical cyclones. And I think back to super typhoon Haiyan when it uh, rammed the Philippines back in 2013. It wasn't the winds, it wasn't the rainfall, but it was a storm surge, uh, caught many coastal Filipinos off guard. And since 2013, it's been a huge outreach and educational effort by Pagasa to educate people on what the storm surge is and the threat and their vulnerabilities. And so the storm surge, that's the increase in sea height above normal tide level caused by tropical cyclones, low pressure, and strong winds. The sea rise is on average 1.5 feet per every 50 millibars of drop in pressure. And then the strong winds add to that, causing water to pile up in the right front quadrant. So again, if you have a very large typhoon, that's going to pile up more water against the landmass than a small or midget typhoon. So Typhoon Sudalor had a very small storm surge uh, effect versus Typhoon U2 has a much larger storm surge problem. And then inundation, that's where the water penetrates into normally dry land. So how much inundation is associated with the typhoon? Uh, the reefs do play a role. Uh, where the reefs are ride, wide, they help dampen the waves. And the waves are larger where reefs are narrow. So for us on Guam, think of uh, the Sheraton and Nico, uh, the Nico Hotel, Gun Beach. That reef is very narrow. So the, the large waves come closer to shore, whereas you have a larger bay like Ganya Bay, uh, Tumon Bay in general, you have much larger reef. Uh, the east coast of all the islands has a very small, narrow reef. So those waves will come right up to the, the cliff line and the shores uh, in vulnerable areas. So this is a famous example of uh, Hurricane Camille in the Gulf Coast of the United States. I believe it was 1969, this three-story apartment complex. Uh, the waves came ashore because as a storm surge uh, increased, those breaking waves that used to be offshore are now breaking over what used to be dry land. And so those repeated waves along with the storm surge destroyed this building. And this is a famous history, uh, historical account of this apartment complex. And I believe a lot of us know of the, the hurricane party that was allegedly going on there. That has been debunked. Um, I believe that was rumor, but there's actually a nice little history of how that came to be. So the effects of storm surge, well, they're wide and varying. It depends on the type of coast you have, uh, the size of the storm, the intensity of the storm, uh, but it's gonna be catastrophic, uh, especially for the larger and more intense uh, typhoons in the region. They cause a lot of problems. Uh, the heavy rainfall, that's a, a major issue that we have to deal with. And again, storm size, speed of motion, 
and exactly the symmetry of the storm where the showers and the rain bands are established can vary differently on what type of rainfall amounts you're expecting. So uh, rainfall can usually be six to 12 inches of rain um, as that tropical cyclone passes, but can be significantly less or more for a certain area. The worst case scenario is we can see rainfall rates of seven inches an hour or more with 30 inches total. Uh, we've had some recent hurricanes in the Gulf Coast uh, causing significant, uh, significant rainfall. I think Hurricane Lar uh, just dumped about two feet of rain over parts of Alabama and the Florida Panhandle because of such a slow moving storm making that uh, landfall. Um, think back for us on Guam, August 27th, we had that flash flood event across central and southern Guam. We were looking at rainfall rates between three and six inches per hour. And so we knew that the potential for flash flooding was uh, definitely going to be there. But typhoons and tropical cyclones, you can see rainfall rates of seven inches an hour or more. That's what we would consider very torrential rainfall. And you're going to have significant problems at that point. Uh, what is TC, uh, tropical cyclone risk? That is the likelihood that a specific location will be hit by a tropical cyclone. And for Guam and the CNMI, that is a high risk. Uh, we are Typhoon Alley for a reason. Uh, and the tropical cyclone return rate, recurrence interval, that is a frequency that an event is expected to occur at a specific location. And that's all derived from our tropical cyclone climatology and historical records. And again, they depend on uh, the time of the year. Our risk uh, varies time of the year. We have two peaks. Again, that's April and May uh, for a small little burst of tropical cyclone activity in the region. And then our more notorious peak is in September through November for Guam and the CNMI. The intensity uh, is part of this risk. Uh, we have more weak than intense tropical cyclones. Um, and that gives us a lesser risk of intense cyclones. You think of recent typhoons that pass through the area, they pass over the Mariana Islands as a category one or two, or even a tropical storm. But sometimes like 2018's Typhoon Main Cut, it passed over Rhoda as a strong category two, low end category three. Over the 24 hours, it was a super typhoon west of the islands. And we've had a number of typhoons that intensify rapidly as they're going over the islands or right after they pass, become a super typhoons. Uh, so if the Guam and the CNMI were located a couple of degrees westward, our intense tropical cyclone risk would be a little bit higher. Uh, the latitude plays a factor and also the El Nino phase and strength. And so again, we're in a La Nina phase. So our risk is going to go a little bit down this year, but when we go to a neutral phase or an El Nino phase, that risk will go up again. So this is a climatology since 1945 of tropical cyclones passing within uh, 60, 120, and 180 nautical miles. That's basically one, two, and three degrees away from Saipan. And Saipan averages about 1.4 tropical cyclones within one degree of the island. And that's considered a direct hit. So here's our climatology. Uh, you're looking at April, May, that's our small spring peak, but then we see all the action really explode through August, September, October, and then starts declining during November. Uh, Guam is much the same with that small peak around April and May, and then they really uh, grow, they spike August, September, and October. So again, we're coming up on the end of September, and it's been a very slow season for us, and that's the good news for all of us in this warning community. However, we still have the rest of September and October to go, and I can tell you this, looking at our numerical models, uh, there are really no suspect areas, at least for the next week or two, and that's realistically as far as we can see at this time. Um, October, hey, we still have a lot of October to go as well as November, so it's always best to keep our guard up because things can and do spin up. Now, as far as TC vulnerability, that's the ability of a location or a people to withstand the effects of a tropical cyclone. If you have a low ability, that equals a high vulnerability. So where are we as far as our abilities to withstand the effects? Are we low ability or are we high ability? And I can tell you this, our warning partners here at Guam and the uh, CNMI, we are very well practiced, well exercised on how to respond to the threats of tropical cyclones and to recover. So that's good for us. And again, the vulnerability that depends on preparation, response, recovery, mitigation, 
and exact characteristics of a tropical cyclone. And so these actions are taken weeks, months, and sometimes years in advance. And this is a continuous effort. Do we have these uh, seminars and workshops just once a year? Yeah, we do. But does it do us good if we have these seminars and workshops every 10 years? Probably not so much because we have a lot of change in personnel, leadership, um, meteorologists, for example. So this training has to be a reoccurring thing that we do with all of our partners in the warning community. Uh, the mitigation, those are actions taken over months and years to reduce the loss of life and property from the eventual tropical cyclone, including the hardening of communication structures and infrastructure. And so this is also a recurring thing that must be nonstop. We are built in concrete reinforced buildings for a reason to improve our mitigation effects. And then also the characteristics, that's the intensity, the size, the speed of movement, the lightning activity, any others, rainfall, for example. Flash floods are a big problem with typhoons here in the mountainous islands. Now, as far as our tropical cyclone program, we issue a lot of text bulletins from our office. And so I'm gonna have to go through these due to the essence of time. And, but they are all found on our webpage and I'll show you quickly where to find those on our webpage. But what are these bulletins? What do they mean? Where can you find the specific information that you need for your operations? And then how often are they issued? Well, the warning process, that starts with the Joint Typhoon Warning Center in Hawaii. Um, we work closely with the JTWC. We monitor for any um, persistent disturbances in the region, and we contact them if we want to put it, what's called an invest area. This puts more resources and assets onto that disturbance that we can monitor for any type of development. Um, once there's a development that looks like it could be a significant threat, we notify the Guam Homeland Security and the CMI Homeland Security Office and other affected locations in Micronesia for that possible threat. The Homeland Security Offices then work with the general public to tell them what it needs to do to prepare. And so it's a, a multifaceted approach that we all work together. So the Joint Typhoon Warning Center, they monitor the region for developing tropical weather systems and they issue daily significant tropical weather advisories listing any disturbances that may or may not develop. Uh, they then alert users that a disturbance is showing the potential for development to a significant tropical cyclone uh, through what they call a tropical cyclone formation alert. We like to put this out on our social media or Facebook pages because that's basically the first step in saying, okay, there's a significant threat developing. Is it for a threat for Guam? Is it a threat for CNMI? Or is it going to stay out the sea and not affect anybody? And that's what's important to the public. Once the disturbance is classified as at least a tropical depression, the JTWC issues track and intensity forecasts known as tropical cyclone bulletins. So we monitor our area of responsibility, which goes from the equator to 25 degrees north latitude and ranges from 130 east longitude between Palau and the Philippines all the way to the dateline. Uh, we look for any kind of weather system that shows signs of development in tropical cyclones, and we issue twice daily satellite interpretation messages and area forecast discussions. So on our webpage, if you look for our forecast, that'll tell you one thing, what to expect in the weather forecast. But if you look for these discussions, that'll give you a little more insight to what's out there and what our expectations are for uh, certain features in the region. Uh, we do maintain direct communications with the Joint Typhoon Warning Center for disturbed weather, and then we issue special weather statements to cover areas not yet warned on by Joint Typhoon Warning Center. So if we see a, a tropical disturbance over Koshari and Pompeii that's generating a lot of showers and thunderstorms, but it's not yet of intensity to be a tropical depression, uh, we're going to put out these weather statements to alert people within that area and downstream of possible development and hazardous weather conditions. So you could say the weather statements is basically our first product issuance for a developing situation. As far as the, the WFO and local government, we evaluate the Joint Typhoon Warning Center warnings for a possible passage near and its effects on specific islands within our area. Uh, based on timing and arrival of damaging winds, we will issue tropical cyclone watches and warnings and a number of other products. So again, those include tropical cyclone public advisories, local statements, and hourly fixes when it's within radar range. 
Uh, we keep a close eye on tropical cyclone centers and motions and will deviate from the joint typhoon warnings if we deem it necessary. Typically, we like to work very closely with JTWC and we collaborate and coordinate on all these fixes and positions to make sure that we are in sync um, as best as we can be. And then finally, the Homeland Security offices, they work with our governor's offices to set the conditions of readiness and activate the emergency operations centers accordingly. Uh, they are tasked with informing the general public and government agencies on provide, providing preparedness instructions. So it's a very synchronized event and it's well rehearsed by all of our agencies. Now we issue bulletins that look similar but have been civilianized from the JTWC's bulletins and images. Uh, we issue forecasts and warnings including tropical cyclone intensities and we give those to our emergency manager partners. But what we're communicating, does the average public know what kind of potential damage to expect from a storm? And sometimes that's kind of a muddy area for us in the warning community. Um, they may read something in our text bulletins, but do they fully understand what that is? That's kind of on the social science and communications process um, to know what the proper and accurate response is. What would be expected winds due to the shelters, houses, offices, boats, crops, airport? Uh, what are the effects? Um, do people even remember to think about storm surge and flash flooding with heavy rainfall? Um, a lot of times, again, people are focused more on the category of the storm and the wind speeds versus the other effects and features of a tropical cyclone. So we take that into account with the Saffir Simpson TC scale or sticks. And what that does, it relates the maximum wind speed to potential damage, coastal wave action, and inundation. So it's a very comprehensive model for expected damage. It's specifically adapted for hurricane and typhoon, cyclone prone tropical locations, and is based on hundreds of tropical cyclones and thousands of observations photos, interviews, and damage reports. Um, a similar scale in the Atlantic does not work too well for the tropical regions. So again, it considers uh, building materials, building styles and practices, agriculture and vegetation in the tropics, um, the effects of termites, of wood rot and salt spray, and then also effects on reef and storm surge heights, as well as the sub-hurricane force winds. And it approximates uh, the maximum sustained wind and wind gust values based on post-storm damage assessments, which we do conduct on the islands after they've been taken a hit. Um, storm category values that correspond to a range of winds and a range of storm surge heights and descriptions of damage and structures um, and vegetation. Now, two primary uses of the scale is to determine the proper evacuation and preparedness decisions by relating tropical cyclones forecast intensity to the corresponding storm category, and then also conducting post-storm wind assessments where wind instruments are not available or have failed. And that happens, unfortunately, frequently out here, especially when dealing with super typhoons. And so this is basically the sticks model all in a chart. So you're seeing tropical storm category A, that's a low, uh, a low grade or a weak tropical storm, and then severe tropical storm B, Typhoons categories one, two, three, four, five, and those are the sustained wind speeds at the top and then the potential wind gusts on the second row. Uh, the damage level goes from weak tropical storm, severe tropical storm to minimal in a category one to catastrophic with a category five. And that's exactly what Tinian and much of Saipan experienced with Super Typhoon U2. And then we relate the inundation for the reefs, uh, the wide reefs versus uh, the narrow reefs. And so we have some pretty wide ranging effects. And this is what we have to consider when we're warning on tropical cyclones and typhoons in the, in the area. Now for our procedures, uh, we're going to look at the definitions, when and how we issue watches and warnings, and then counseling watches and warnings. And there is some confusion uh, with the, the watch and warning process in my dealing in the last couple months working with some of our partners and folks in the region. Um, I got a question. I'll be dealing with that shortly. <laughs> um, there is some confusion with our watches and warnings and how that relates to the conditions of readiness. And so we want to make sure that we in the warning community are fully on top of that. Damaging winds, 
That's what we base our watches and warnings on. And those are tropical storm force winds of 39 miles per hour or more. A tropical depression becomes a tropical storm when it sustained one minute winds have reached 39 miles per hour. This is the basis for our watches and warnings. Destructive winds are sustained surface winds of 58 miles per hour or more. And that's again, average over a one minute period. So tropical storm watch, that's when we ex, uh, when damaging winds of 39 mile per hour or more are possible from a tropical storm within 48 hours. So again, a tropical storm watch is when tropical storm force damaging winds of 39 miles per hour or more are possible. That's the key word possible uh, with a tropical storm within 48 hours. A typhoon watch is when a developing typhoon poses a possible threat within 48 hours. And again, typhoon watch, that's when we uh, have 39 mile per hour damaging winds are possible within 48 hours associated with a typhoon or what we expect to eventually develop into a typhoon. The tropical storm warning, that's when tropical storm conditions are expected. And again, the key word is expected within 24 hours or are already occurring. And similarly, the typhoon warning, that's when damaging winds of 39 miles per hour or more are expected or occurring uh, within 24 hours. So those are the key changes or the differences there. So make sure you realize that a tropical storm watch, a typhoon watch, and the warnings are not based on when that eye is forecast to move over your location. That's only when damaging winds of 39 miles per hour or more are expected or possible of your location. And that can be a significant lead time by hours or more before the center of the storm passes uh, overhead or closest to your area. And again, civilian typhoon warnings are based on the arrival of 39 miles per hour, not the passage of the eye. And this is because the goal is to provide people 24 hours or at least 12 hours of daylight to prepare for uh, those weather conditions. Uh, we want to For people to be fully prepared and shall be these tropical structures on the islands and moving up. And we have a always plan for the next category of intensity. So if we're expecting just a tropical storm to pass over Guam, uh, we ask that people plan for a category one typhoon because rapid intensification is one of the uh, one of our fears in the forecasting business uh, to occur. If we expect a category one, but you see rapid intensification in the 12 hours leading up to a, a passage, uh, we might be forecasting category one, but you could be dealing with a category two or three storm. And so we have to be concerned for and watch out for the possibility of rapid intensification. So always plan for the next category of severity. Now, again, here's the watches and warnings in a chart, uh, the meaning. The tropical storm watch, that's damaging winds are possible. Um, with a warning, damaging winds or more are expected. And there's a time frame, so within 48 hours or within 24 hours. Now, sometimes people are confused because it is possible we can have a tropical storm warning with a typhoon watch. And that's when a typhoon passes uh, near a location within 24 hours, but the typhoon force winds are not expected. They're just possible but you do expect to have tropical storm force conditions. And that could be the scenario with a, uh, a small typhoon passing over Rota and Guam could see the tropical storm force winds, but not expected to see the typhoon force winds. So that's important to take note of in your communications process and also the understanding of our bulletins and forecasts. Now, as far as canceling watches and warnings, uh, they're canceled when the threat of tropical storm force or typhoon force winds have ended either by moving away or dissipating. Typically, it's by moving away. And the warnings are canceled when damaging winds cease and are no longer expected and the potential for coastal flooding and inundation by the sea has subsided. Um, so we constantly monitor the latest observations and data coming in from just our partners and also the sensors that we have available, um, as well as satellite derived information. 
to make sure those conditions have subsided before we cancel those watches and warnings because we want to make sure people are safe. Um, a typhoon warning will not usually be stepped down to a tropical storm warning as winds diminish unless the typhoon changes direction or weakens significantly and typhoon conditions on the islands are deemed no longer possible. Um, in either case, we coordinate closely with the Guam Homeland Security Office and the CNMI Homeland Security Office uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page and ready to work on this um, together. The conditions of readiness set by Guam and the CNMI, those are coordinated closely with us, but the cores are issued by the governor's office. The Weather Service does not set the condition of readiness. That is done by the, the governor's offices. And so routinely, uh, normal conditions, we are at core four or condition four, and that basically means tropical storm force conditions are possible within 72 hours. We are always at core four. This is, again, condition normal. We start going through the sequence of steps to three, two, and one when we actually see that uh, threat materializing upstream of us. And again, condition three is related closely to our watches, and condition two is related closely to our warnings. Now, sometimes uh, we we're watching our social media and we see a lot of questions and confusion when the cores and the watches and warnings are being progressed through. A lot of people think the conditions are based on intensity with condition two not being as intense as condition one, uh, or people relate condition one should be a super typhoon and condition two should be a, a weak typhoon, condition three is a tropical storm. That's incorrect. And so we have to watch out for that in the warning business that people fully understand what these conditions of readiness mean. It's not the intensity, but it's a timing-based uh, preparedness posture uh, that we're focused on. So you can have a condition one for a tropical storm, or for super typhoons. So keep that in mind because we have to know exactly what we're communicating. Uh, the products that are issued, Joint Typhoon Warning Center, this is what the graphics look like. It shows the, uh, uh, the tropical cyclone, its path, and its uh, wind field. The times are issued in UTC or Zulu, and they use knots for wind speed, and they use nautical miles for distance to any number of points. Now, what is the UTC or Zulu? Basically, it's Greenwich, England. That is the time on the zero meridian, zero degrees longitude, and it's 12 hours from the dateline. Uh, for us, you just add 10 hours to the UTC time to get tomorrow's standard time. Uh, these are some of the conversions. But why use UTC or Zulu? Well, it's so we can compare times anywhere in the world and sync with each other. We can easily talk to FEMA partners in DC, San Francisco, and Honolulu, and Guam and know exactly what time frame we're talking about. Now, when we put out our forecasts and bulletins, we convert them to civilian terms. Uh, we use Chamorro Standard Time and Island Local Standard Time. Uh, we use miles per hour for speed and use statute miles for distance. And this is typically what our products, our graphics look like. We're gonna have a little bit of a cosmetic change in the coming months as we go to a similar but a newer version of this software. But this is what you're gonna be looking at on the map. And when we put out our graphics, we have more of the, uh, the islands as well as the smaller warning points. Um, the weather service here on Guam, we have 39 warning points across the region that we have to issue our watches and warnings for uh, these various locations if they have a tropical cyclone threat. And so this map will depict that and it has all the information available. Now, there's also a lot of confusion with what this plot means. That thin line in the middle that's not exactly where the only effects will be. That's just where the forecast center of the typhoon is expected to pass. This is a deterministic forecast, basically showing at that time of the models what we expect the conditions to be. Six hours later, the forecast will change just a little bit, and that's just the nature of forecasting tropical cyclones. So again, this line exactly is where the center of the tropical cyclone is expected to pass based on this latest model issuance. The white area indicates where the track will fall uh, within 70% of the time based on average five-year error. So that center of storm could pass as far north as this barrier or as far south as this area of the cone. And then the hashed area, that is the extent of tropical storm force winds. So this is what you need to know when you're looking at these plots. 
Now, the primary product that we issue, uh, Tropical Cyclone Information, is a public advisory. Uh, we use that to issue and cancel all tropical cyclone watches and warnings, and it provides essential information about the tropical cyclone location, the movement and intensity, as well as general forecast information and expectations. Uh, the timing of damaging winds and typhoon winds, and as well as storm surge height and rain amounts. Uh, this provides general call to action statements and precautions that the public should use. This is issued every day at 2 a.m. and p.m. and 8 a.m. p.m. So every six hours on the twos and eights. Uh, we like to get this information out ahead of the hour uh, just to have it out to the public as soon as we receive the information from the, the new Joint Typhoon Warning Center warning. And again, we use this to place watches and warnings for islands. When there's no threat to an island, this is every six hours, but when there is a watch or warning in effect for any island or warning point in our region, that's 39 again, we'll issue intermediate public advisories uh, that will be on the fives and the 11. So every three hours to update tropical cyclone location and track information. And we could also use this to cancel watches and warnings. The special public advisories are issued as needed to provide significant tropical cyclone forecast changes and could be used to issue new watches and warnings uh, set between the standard public advisory times. So again, those are our public advisories. The local statements provide a lot more detailed information for individual islands and warning points. Uh, these can be a long bulletin, so you need to know exactly where to find your information and what information is in this bulletin. And again, it's detailed localized information regarding the expected magnitude and timing of tropical cyclones threat to each island. It recaps all watches of warnings in effect and current tropical cyclone information. We also pull in uh, evacuation and preparedness information from the Homeland Security and emergency management offices uh, for each island under watches of warnings. And then also expected rain amounts, potential for flooding, potential for mudslides, um, expected storm surge heights, surf heights and timing, and inundation. And then of course it brings in all the wind information, the onset timing of damaging and typhoon winds, maximum winds and approximate time and directions. So again, the local segments, they are very long detailed information. This is what you wanna look at when you want to know exactly what effects we are forecasting for your individual location. Again, we do that for Guam, Rota, Tinian, and Saipan, and then three islands up in the Northern Mariana Islands, as well as multiple points across Micronesia. So this is where you can get that critical localized information. Yeah, only if you're in a watcher warning. Now, when you have a, when we have a tropical cyclone within our range of the radar, which is roughly 230 miles or closer from Guam, we'll be issuing hourly tropical cyclone updates. And this is when we're pulling center location or eye information from our radar. And we put these out every hour to remark on the tropical cyclone center location and movement. And the confidence is based on the radar imagery as long as it's available and the distance and bearing from Agatha or one of the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, this updated position will be used in subsequent public advisories and local statements. And this is what that product typically will look like. Um, it's a text-based product. This graphic is just added uh, on the side and it may not always be there or it will not always be there, but we'll put this on our Facebook when we have the time to do it. But it's a text bulletin showing exactly where we pinpointed the center of the eye uh, based on radar, where it's going and the diameter, uh, the rainfall and other information. Now, one of the things that's important to note is a lot of times people are watching the eye of a storm pass near the islands and you see a little bit of a wobble and people panic if you, we're expecting something to go through the road of channel it might have a little bit of a wobble look like it's going to start going due west into guam or it might wobble go north into rota but that's just a small wobble in the eye and these typhoons typically do that as the mass rotates around the center of circulation. But the overall trend is still holding course, as you see in these plots. This is in the red is uh, Typhoon Hagibis as it was moving through the islands. And down here, this is Anatahan. 
So these are two different plots, the black and the red. Um, the JTWC is a solid uh, line versus the radar, that's the dotted line that has a lot more definition in this path. So we're gonna see these little wobbles, but generally the overall course and track um, is holding steady. Now these are the products that we, be, that we issue onto our webpage. Uh, the one on the left, that's our forecast track. The one on the left is our air track showing the range of uh, deviation that the center of the storm could pass within this white cone. Now we've also noticed uh, through our social media, and I'll tell you what, monitoring the Facebook page has been providing a lot of insights. We started a Facebook page in 2013 because we see exactly where the confusion is in the public. People can send us messages or comment on photos and be confused about what this plot on the left means. Where is the blue, the yellow, and the red? Well, the red is typhoon force winds or greater. The yellow, those are destructive winds, and the blue, those are tropical storm force winds. And so we typically will issue a tropical storm warning for everything forecast to be in the blue. That would be Tinian to Agrigan. Um, so for this example, we may not have Guam in a watch or warning uh, based on what the previous forecasts have been. But again, the blue, that's tropical storm force winds. The yellow are destructive tropical storm force winds. And the red, those are typhoon force winds. And so we tried to explain that on our social media and also the graphics down here on the bottom uh, showing exactly what those range of winds are. Now on our webpage, there's so much information on our webpage. And so if you're not familiar with it, I strongly urge you to go to our webpage at www.weather.gov slash gum, G-U-M, and just click around a bit because there's a lot of information available and you need to know what you're looking at and what to find. Uh, in short time if you're tasked to know where our information is. So you can find a forecast, uh, endless satellite and radar imagery, uh, the surface weather observations from the islands and surrounding waters, uh, whether it's the data buoys or from the airports, the automated surface observing systems, um, the upper air observations from Guam, Palau, Yapchu, Pompeii, Major, and Kwajalein, and the climate data. So this is all on our webpage. And if you're not familiar with it, it's not going to be very user friendly. So I, again, I recommend you go to our webpage, weather.gov slash gum, and just click around because you can find a lot of stuff. Up in the top in the red box, those are the links for the National Weather Service information at the national level. But here down lower, that's for the more localized products, the current hazards, conditions, radar forecasts, um, and, and so on. As Brandon mentioned earlier, we have our routine products, but then we have our event-driven products. A lot of our event-driven products, those will be highlighted in the pink banners down below the map or down here on the side if it's for Guam and the CNMI. And again, those are event-driven and issued when we see certain conditions or hazards reaching a certain criteria. And that's when we had to put out these bullets like flash flood warnings, uh, hazardous surf advisory, small craft advisories. And they may have little or no lead time. But our forecast discussion, we try to mention that stuff ahead of time, that the possibility is there for these conditions to become established across the region. Now, if you click on current hazards, the first drop down will be the tropical cyclones. This is where you want to go for our latest tropical cyclone information. It will have uh, the, the links to our forecast and air tracks, as well as the various text bulletins. It could be the public advisory, or the hurricane or typhoon local statement, or the hourly fixes if it's within radar range of Guam. And then down below, if you like the tracking charts, um, you can print out this tracking chart and follow it by hand and plot your maps. And then this day and age of virtual learning, I highly recommend if you have kids, print out some of these maps and have them do that through typhoon season. And they can learn all about latitudes and longitude and where to track a storm. So we like to do this in some of our training seminars and as Chip has done in previous workshops, he has a module on plotting storms. Obviously we can't do that for the, uh, in this virtual setting and the shortness of time, but in the future, hopefully uh, we can get back in person and start talking and meeting again in person. When you click on this middle link, the forecast, this brings up all of our local forecast products, uh, the zone forecast, seven day, text, uh, the surf zone forecast, and also the marine waters forecast for eastern and western Micronesia, and the forecast discussion. 
be sure to click on this forecast discussion link because that's where you can really see what we're thinking at the office. Um, we're guided by certain phraseology and terminology and restrictions in our bulletins here, but the discussion uh, can help you read between the line and show you what we're thinking when we say the question. Uh, can the public find this web page by Google search? Is the web address available in the public advisory warning? I used to be able to do that. I just look up Guam tropical cyclones and there should be a, uh, one of the top links on Google, but otherwise just uh, look for Guam National Weather Service and you'll see the link to our web page. And then for the marine conditions on the forecast menu, click on marine and you see all the coastal waters forecasts uh, for the various islands. And then you can also find us on Facebook at US National Weather Service Guam. Now it's important to note that the Facebook page is, even though it's a critical element in our communication strategy here in the islands, it is a secondary communication strategy because our top priority is getting out those official watches and warnings and text bulletins out and issued timely. Once we get those bulletins, watches and warnings out, then we can go and put the effort into the, the Facebook and social media pages. Um, so not everything will be always posted to our social media. So that's important to note. The most up-to-date information is on our webpage uh, and then secondarily on our Facebook pages. We're also on Twitter as well. We just started up our Twitter page. Uh, so do find us at NWS Guam on Twitter. Um, a lot of our information does come through our social media as far as where people get their information. And again, the key to remember is not the latest information can be found on our Facebook page. That's always on our web page. But when we can, we do want to put this out on our Facebook page as well. And so we've had some pretty high metrics a lot of hits on our Facebook page and especially high um, high visibility events like tropical cyclones and approaching typhoons. Um, but another way that we like to reach out and communicate with people is through the Weather Ready Nation. This is an agency-wide outreach program uh, with the National Weather Service and we like to use this to foster new partnerships in the community in support of increased weather readiness and resiliency. Uh, currently they the weather forecast office here on Guam is ranked second in the nation with its number of organizations and offices engaged in the weather rating nation. So, and I know most of many of you all that signed up for this webinar um, are part of this weather rating nation. So it's great to see you all up here and I recognize a lot of your names and uh, the faces that are available. Uh, we will put, uh, as Brandon mentioned, we will be, put web links to our text bulletins on our Facebook posts. So if you see something on our Facebook page, you can always click that link and see the full text bulletin. Um, let's see, any social study on how public response to warnings? Well, that's a question from somebody already. Um, I was doing a social science study back in 2018 on how we communicate weather on Guam and how people get that information. That was quite an eye opener uh, here because in the States, a lot of people get their information from wireless emergency alerts and also broadcast meteorologists. Uh, currently, we don't have either of those options available here at the islands, but wireless emergency alerts, that's a process uh, that's ongoing. We hope to get that established in a couple of years, but the broadcast sector uh, doesn't exist. Uh, and so the, really the only weather authority here in the islands is the weather service. And so we're trying to bridge some of those gaps through Facebook Live and other social media platforms. And hopefully when we do have a, a tropical cyclone threat, we will be more routine and current with our Facebook Live broadcast because they've had tremendous success getting weather information out and also answering questions live during those Facebook Live. Um, and we also welcome feedback. So always consider emailing us or calling us or giving a, a heads up on any feedback, what works and what doesn't work because that's how we improve our services and better communicate. But back to weather ready, thanks Brandon for those questions. Um, we focus our Weather Ready program on awareness, education, and outreach, and we really want to get out more to the public uh, to get this information out and work with our partners. And we're still reaching out across Micronesia, and especially the CNMI. Um, I personally have put a lot of time and effort into the Weather Ready program uh, across Guam, but unfortunately because of COVID and the travel, um, I can't get up to CNMI quite as much as I would like to to reach out to our partners up there but hopefully COVID will slow down soon. 
Uh, the most visible, tangible item of this outreach is the weather alert email. And what we like to do is send out this weather alert email direct to our weather ready partners. Um, basically, it's a plain language statement saying what the threat is, when the threat is, and where. Um, because based on the study that I did in 2018, people really want to know what is it, when is it, and where is it. And so we try to uh, do these daily weather alert emails for the islands facing a significant threat and then provide them links to where to get the full text bulletins and more information. So this is geared to be a plain language email direct to our weather ready uh, base and shows them where that threat is and where to get more information. Um, just usually one page, maybe two pages at the most. And again, this is one of the most visible items to really uh, get people in the general population geared up for the threat and where to start taking action. And so if you're not part of the Weather Ready Nation yet, um, Maria did email you uh, two documents, I believe last night, for this seminar. One was the frequently asked questions and application sheet for Weather Ready Nation, Weather Ready Nation and also the, uh, the fact sheet for tropical cyclones in the region. Uh, some of the climatology on that fact sheet was based on Guam, but we do have it available for the CNMI. But if you're not part of the Weather Ready Nation, or you are, but your contact information has changed, please do send, uh, fill out that application. It's a one pager, it just provides a point of contact. And then we can link up with the Weather Ready Nation because we really want to grow this and establish it, not just in Guam and CNMI, but across all of Micronesia. And hopefully if um, COVID does slow down and eventually disappear, uh, we'd like to start traveling again and visiting the islands in person. Um, but you can contact me, fill out that form and email it to me at marcus.idlet at noah.gov. And just in case you're confused, um, I go by Landon and my brother goes by Brandon, but our first name is what the government uses. So it's Marcus and William. So email that uh, application for the Weather Ready Nation to marcus.idlet at noah.gov and I can process you and get that in. The WFO go on, we are 24-7 uh, every day of the year and we're always monitoring for everything. And we also welcome feedback. So if you ever have a question or you observe something on a flooded street or something, send us a holler, send me an email or uh, message our webmaster. If you go to our webpage, you go all the way down and it says contact us, send us information to the Guam uh, webmaster and we'll get that information there as well as our Guam Facebook at NWS Guam. We're also on Twitter, that's NWS Guam. Um, but feel free to email me or call us at any time uh, and touch base with us because it's the feedback that really helps us see what works, what doesn't work and how we can improve our services. Um, and this an educational process is a two way process for us um, to communicate with you all and our partner. And as Chip Garner stated in the past, it's the three-legged stool, the media, the Homeland Security, and the Weather Service. Without one of those legs, uh, we cannot stand properly. So we're all a part of this process to make sure our islands, our public, our people are fully prepared uh, for whatever disaster strikes. And with that, I'm pretty much done. I just went a little bit over time, so not too bad. But I do want to pass this over to Chuck again. I know in the, the registration process, a lot of people had been commenting on, on uh, Charles is not available. Okay, so I think Homeland Security, they'll get back to y'all on that at some point. Um, but they have a lot of information on sheltering and evacuation processes in this time of COVID. And I know a lot of people when registering for this um, seminar, there were issues or questions about what to do with COVID and how the sheltering is going to be handled. I will say the Homeland Security partners, they've been training and working with this very subject since I believe February or March. And so they have a lot of information and details and you can contact them for specific information as needed. But uh, with that, um, if you have any questions, this has been a, a very quick run through of a tropical cyclone workshop. Uh, Chip Guard has traditionally done this on a two day uh, workshop. We condensed this into two hours in support of National Preparedness Month. So thank you for coming over here. I really do hope that we can get up uh, out to the public and meet with you all in person uh, next year, hopefully, uh, for this 
workshop. Um, but thank you all for coming. Uh, did you have anything to say, Maria? Nothing, Brandon? All right. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email and we'll get back to you. We can also email you the slides um, and touch base with you after the seminar. So if any questions or comments in the meantime, I think we'll end it otherwise.